<laughs> Welcome to Foundations Church from your living room <laughs> or your office or car, wherever you are. But wherever you are today, we're so glad that you have joined us this morning um, in our worship and in the Word today. So wherever you are, would you just stand with us? And we're just going to worship. You make a way when I cannot see. You are my strength. Though my heart is weak, you won't let go. You take my place on this battlefield. You go before. You're my sword, my shield. I'm not alone, yeah. You fight for me. You always have, you always have my victory. It's in your hands, in your hands. The God of heaven is my defense. No weapon for will get to me the enemy underneath your feet my god my hope you won't let go yeah you fight for me you always have you always have my victory it's in your hands in your hands This is how I fight my 
battles. Sing it out now. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 You fight for me. You always have, you always have my victory. It's in your hands, in your hands. The God of heaven is my defense. You fight for me, you always have, you always have my victory. It's in your hands, in your hands, the God of heaven is my Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song, because you are good, you're good. Oh, 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 let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in my waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in my waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, is my soul, cause you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. 
You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, you're good.
And God, we just thank you that we can trust you, that we can trust the name of Jesus. It is so sweet. It's the name of Jesus. And God, we just thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you that you'll never leave us, that you'll never forsake us. And God, we thank you that in these times, we just call upon the name of Jesus and your word says that you save us. We love you, God. We love you, Lord, and we just worship you this morning. Wherever we are, we lift up the precious, the sweetest, most beautiful name that there is. And that is Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, good morning, Foundations Church. We are we're glad to be with you. Um, we're glad that we have the ability to be with you, um, even even if we're not all together. If you're on the uh, the website or if you're on our um, Facebook page, you can you can check over there. We do have um, uh, for those of you who maybe discovered it, we did try and put the lyrics um, up for you to print them out. Um, uh, for the songs, you know, you can you can log on, and hopefully we'll we'll get better as the weeks go on. But uh, we can you can log on, and you can you can print out the songs. You know what songs we're going to be singing, so you can join with us from home. We also have uh, uh, a bulletin that that should be getting posted uh, at some point in in the next few minutes up there, so you can look at that and get some announcements, some ways to connect with everybody. Um, encourage you to do that. Um, we, um, we're in a, we're in a strange season around the world. It's very, very strange when the whole world is, finds itself in a place where it's frozen, it's frozen in time. And, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in Iran or whether you're in Lebanon or whether you're in, uh, Switzerland or whether you're in Canada or whether you're, um, in here in, in the United States, it doesn't really matter where we are. We're all facing uh, the same kinds of, of situations, the same kinds of issues. You know, the Church of Jesus Christ has got a lot to say in a time like this. I think what's exciting is that all across the world, the, the airwaves, the, the, the internet, the, um, uh, the, the Facebook live streams on Sunday across the world is church after church after church proclaiming across the airways, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're really excited that there is that opportunity because we have something to say to the world, because we have a hope in Jesus Christ, because we understand that the name of Jesus is the name above every name. We, we understand that, that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. We understand that in the name of Jesus, there is salvation. We understand that because of what Jesus did uh, on, the, on the cross, there is a, a way that we can be free from the fear uh, that surrounds us in the world. We understand uh, that he purchased for us not just redemption from sin, uh, but the, the confidence that, that of, of healing in our bodies and protection in our bodies. But beyond that, we know that we can have eternal life with him. We can trust him. We can trust him with our lives. We can trust him in the midst of this season. So... Uh, part of part of the challenge for us in this in this time of of disconnection, this time of isolation uh, that many of us are experiencing, is to uh, continue to lean into community. There's some ways on our website you can find out uh, foundationschurch.com. You can find out how you can do that. Um, be, become part of a group. If you're here in the Williamsburg area, uh, we want to be connected with you. We want to. There's lots of innovative ways that we're going to be doing our groups uh, in this this coming week. We want. We want to know who you are. We want to know how we can help you. We want to know how we can reach out to you, how we can serve you. But there's also some other things we can do in this time. One of the things uh, that, that, that happens in times of uncertainty is we, we hunker down and we, we start trying to uh, you know, get what we've got and protect what we have and, and hoard the toilet paper because, um, because it's terrifying to think that we might not have enough of that. 
um, when the end of the world comes. And so there, there is this, this sense that um, the Lord calls us to, 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 to not have a posture of clo- being closed off to him and everybody else, but to have open hands and open arms and to trust him. And one of the ways we can do that is with our giving. Um, we, this week already, we've uh, seen uh, the Lord has incredibly blessed us and blessed our church and provided for our needs. Uh, we, we needed to spend some money on some technology so that we could actually meet the needs of our community uh, in, in a different kind of season that we're in. Uh, we also had our first family that we had to, uh, we had to help uh, um, prevent being evicted from their home. Uh, because this economic crisis is, 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 is following this, this disease very rapidly. And so now's not a time to, to close off and say, well, I, I don't know if I'm going to have enough a month from now or two months from now. Now's the time to trust the Lord. You see, when we give, what we're doing is we're telling the Lord, we're telling the Lord that we trust Him with what we have. We're giving back to Him what belongs to Him. We're giving back to Him our sense of trust and confidence in Him. You know, there was a, a time in, when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, we read about it it's, and, he, and he's uh, commending to them the, the churches of Macedonia who were experiencing great affliction. And, and it says they're in, in, in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. They gave not just according to their means, as I can testify, but beyond their means of their own accord, uh, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. You know, the, the truth is, is that we are entering a season where, where, where the people of our community need the church more than ever and where we have the opportunity to reach out and help, and we want to be able to do that. And so just to encourage you, uh, I'm not worried about, um, about the Lord not having enough money because the Lord's got enough money to do what He needs to do with us, but I am, I, I'm, I'm anxious for all of us that we, we, don't, we don't get into a place where we, we cease to trust God with what we have, and we cease to realize that God has, has given us the opportunity to reach out and to help each other in a time of trial, in a time of affliction, in a time of crisis uh, that we're experiencing in our community and around the world. So I encourage you, you can go on our website, you can give online securely. Uh, you, the mailing address is on the website. You can drop a check in the mail if, if that's what you want to do. Uh, but don't do it for our sake. Do it to demonstrate to the Lord that, that you trust Him. Whether it's little, whether it's large, whatever you can do, trust Him with what you have because He is faithful. And that's really uh, something else I wanted to say. Uh, the, the other announcement I wanted to make really to our community is we, we, we said goodbye to some dear friends of ours yesterday, the, the Veda family who've been with us from the beginning of the time of the church. They actually helped to come up from Alabama to help us actually plant the church. They were very, I've said it many times, but they're very instrumental uh, really in, in, the, in, the, in the, the founding and the, the establishment of Foundations Church. Uh, John, Natalie, uh, Maya, and baby Solomon. And we're sad to see them go. We're excited about this new chapter in their life. They're going back to, to, to Alab- the, the Alab- Huntsville, Alaba- uh, Alabama area. John has continued to work in the ministry of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, working with churches across the country. I've j- I was just with him in Israel a few weeks ago, and we were there ministering to a bunch of pastors from all over the country. And uh, I'm really excited that John has taken on that work and is continuing that work. And uh, they're driving back to Alabama today. They did a little farewell video. We, we were able to pray with them and, 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 and see them off yesterday. There's a little farewell video to them. Uh, if, if we'd been able to have them here in person, we would have done it in person. But it's there on our Facebook page. And so I just encourage you to check that out and, um, and find ways to reach out to them as well to, to let them know um, uh, that you'll miss them and stay in touch with them. We, um, we, last week, we, we began a series. And I really, you know, sometimes you, you have a plan and you, you, you feel that the Lord's laid something on your heart. And you, um, and you wonder, you know, is this really, is this really the, the appropriate thing that we should be speaking about right now? And I, I wrestle with that. Uh, we, we began a series in the, the book of Ezra. E- Ezra is not a book that, that most of us really are, are super familiar with from the Old Testament. 
The context is, is this season of restoration. It's the return of the Jewish people from a period of, of great um, of exile, the Babylonian exile. Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, the people are uh, 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 taken off into exile. And, and I, I really went through last week, we went through um, the first sort of six chapters of Ezra very in, a, in an overview way. I uh, encourage you to check it out on our page. With, you just listen to the audio on SoundCloud or, or you can see um, our, our slightly shaky live stream uh, version on, on Facebook. But uh, if you, um, what, what we see is there's a season of God's favor when after the exile is over, he, he turns with favor to look again upon his people. And, and we saw that there was, there was three phases of the exile. So there was three phases of the return. The Jewish people have this decree. They come back to the land. And immediately they encounter the opposition. In Ezra chapter 4, they, the, the peoples of the land don't want them rebuilding the house of the Lord and the work on the Lord stop the work on the house of the Lord stops until God raises up prophets Haggai Zechariah who, who speak to the people and say don't don't fear the intimidation of those around you don't 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 worry about what the king may or may not be saying the Lord has told you to rebuild so rebuild your lives rebuild the house of God and as they reaffirm that they move from being a people in discouragement and despair to a people who defiantly trust in the word of the Lord. That, that's a word for us as a people right now. It's very easy to be intimidated by the news that we see on, on, on TV around us and on Facebook and wherever we, we look at it. Uh, it's very easy to be, um, to be in despair, despair about our lives or our businesses or our economic situation. It's very easy to be in despair about the, the direction that we're going as a, as a global community, but also as a country. But you know what happens is the people are stirred up in that moment. They hear the word of the Lord and they defy what they're hearing by, by saying we're going to trust God. We're not going to give in to the intimidation around us. You know, there's a spirit of intimidation in the world right now that would make us feel that, that, that everything it's to quote R.E.M., it's the end of the world as we know it, you know, and there's this sense that, that, that everything's falling apart. And, and the truth is, is God is, it's not falling apart because God is still on his throne. And yes, there is, it's a time of great need and a time of great trouble and a time of great crisis. There's no, there's no denying that. But we can trust him. This is what they're called to do in Ezra chapter, chapter 5 and 6. They, that the eye of God was upon them. The people rose up. And what happened is as they rose up, God came to meet them. The, the, in a sense, the decree from the, the king is reaffirmed. And, and, and they're not just given back all the gold and the silver of the temple, but they're also the people of the land are, are commanded by the king to provide them the, the sacrifices and the animals and the oil and the wine, and everything they need. Uh, complete provision to restore their worship in the house of the Lord. Because the restoration of the temple of God is not an end in itself. It's a means to enable the people to return to the Lord. You see, what God's allowing to take place in the world around us is not just about what's taking place in the world around us. It's a mechanism through which the Lord is calling the people of this planet back to himself. He's, 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 he's reminding us that we are but frail humans. We are but flesh, that we think we're so brilliant because we have an iPhone and that we can put a, put a rocket into space. But actually, we're, we're terrified of this microscopic piece of viral bacteria, virus that, that we can't understand and we can't control and we can't fix. Because the truth is we need God. We need, his, we need to trust him in our lives and we need his provision. The purpose of, of what God allows to take place in our lives is in order for us to, to realize that we have to return to him. It's all about returning to him. It's all about trusting him. And so that leads us to Ezra chapter 7. And, and, and I want you to turn with me to Ezra chapter 7 because this is actually the very beginning. We're halfway through the book and we, we haven't actually met the main character yet. And, and this is when um, Ezra appears on the scene. This is quite a, a number of years. The, the, the first six chapters of Ezra cover a, a 60, 70 year span of history. I'm not quite sure exactly. Didn't do the numbers, but uh, it's quite a long span of history. And this is where Ezra, it's the very end of the third wave of the returning of the people when Ezra comes onto the scene. And I'm going to read Ezra chapter seven for you, wherever you are, um, just to open up your Bibles. And, and follow 
along with me. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Atitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merioth, son of Zehariah, son of Uzi, son of Bukai, son of Abishai, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon, Babylonia. And he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given and the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was also upon him. And then he went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king, and some of the people and some of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was upon him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And this is a copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the Lord of God of heaven, I now make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to carry the silver and the gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia. And all the free will offerings of the people and the priests vowed willingly for the house of the God, of their God that is in Jerusalem. And with this money, then you shall with all diligence buy bulls and rams and lambs with their grain offerings, their drink offerings. And you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you, your brothers to do with the rest of the silver or gold you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels you, that have been given you for the service of the house of God, you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem, whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. And I, Artaxerxes the king, make a decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river. Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the Lord, the God of heaven requires of you, let it be done with all diligence, up to a hundred, thousand, a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of God, the God of heaven, lest his wrath be against the realm and the king and his sons. And we notify you that it should not be lawful to impose tribute, custom or toll on anyone of the priests and the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, the other servants of the house of God. You know, the, the abundance of the provision of God for his people is astonishing. This is a people who've been exiled. This is a people who've been enslaved. This is a people who have lost everything. And the abundance of God is available for them. And I, and, and I really believe that that's a word of encouragement for us. You see, we serve the King of Kings and he has more than enough. He has more than enough for us and it may look a little different and it doesn't mean we're going to have everything we want. But when God sets his hand to look with favor upon his people, they have what they need. They have more than enough because we serve a God of restoration. And in a season when it seems like the whole world is collapsing around us, we need to hang on to the truth of his word that God is able to restore us. God is able to restore us to himself. God is able to restore us to each other. And God is able to restore his purposes in us. And that doesn't mean we'd, we're just going to have everything we want whenever we want it. But God is able to provide all our needs according to his riches and glory. Because he's a faithful God. And we can trust him. Verse 25, and you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people. Uh, in the province beyond the river, such as know the laws of your God and those who do not know them you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. 
And blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing in, as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors, before all the king's mighty officers. And I took courage, for the hand of my Lord, my God, was upon me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. You know, it begins Ezra chapter 7. This Ezra went up from Babylonia, verse 6, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the, God, the Lord, the God of heaven, had given him. And the king granted to him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord God was upon him. This Ezra, I, I just love that phrase. This guy, this is the guy that came up from Babylonia. You know, in the Hebrew, uh, the word is, the, it's who Ezra. Who is the, is the, just means this, it's the, this guy, it means he, he Ezra, he, who Ezra, and it, it reminds me that, that it, it has come to my attention that within our little community here in Williamsburg, we have a, we have a few fans of the Cincinnati Bengals, um, th that's a football team, uh, um, American football team. They throw the ball, they don't kick the ball. It's, it's called the NFL, uh, for those of you who don't know about it. Anyway, and they have this saying, who day? It means who day? I don't really know what it means, but, but you can't go around Cincinnati Bengals fans. They have these big t-shirts, and I know this because my daughter happens to be one. Uh, who Ezra? Who day? You know, this, this incredible, this guy. We are the people. This is the guy. There's something about this phrase. This, there's something that sets Ezra apart from everybody else in his generation. There are many, 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 many people throughout the whole of the Babylonian Empire. There are many scribes and there are many priests. There are many, there are many Jewish people across the... But what set Ezra apart to receive such favor from the hand of the Lord? Many others went up. You see, he's following... And we read about it in, in Ezra chapter 8. There's this, there's this huge genealogy of all the people. There's a list of all the men and all the women and all the families and all the heads of family, uh, fathers' households who went up with Ezra. And, and they gather together and he calls them to fast and pray. And they actually refuse to ask the king for armed soldiers to, 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 to go with them on this long perilous journey, even though they're carrying all this gold and all this silver and all this stuff. Because he said, if the hand of the Lord isn't able to protect us, then, then, we, then, then, then the Lord isn't powerful enough to protect us in the land of, of Israel. But we believe in, and trust in the hand of our God. You know, there, there's something very powerful about this Ezra. And he's taking this journey all the way from Babylonia, all the way to the land of Israel. It's a journey that many others have taken before. Abraham took it. Jacob took it. Um, we see, um, you know, the great men of faith throughout history have taken this journey all the way from Babylonia, all the way across the Fertile Crescent. You go from what's now modern day Iraq, even from like Ur on the edge of the Persian Gulf, all the way up through, through the uh, following the Euphrates, all the way up to Haran and then down into to Syria, down into Damascus and then coming down on the coast by um, the coast of the land of Israel down into Egypt. Because in the ancient world, there are two great areas of civilization, Mesopotamia, the land of Iraq and Iran and Persia and Babylonia and all that. And then there was Egypt by the Nile. And this is the route, the Via Maris, the great trade route, the great, the way of the sea. And, and for years, generations, even to this day, this is the great highway of the ancient world. And Ezra sets foot upon this highway. Many others have traveled this route before, but something makes Ezra different. You see, he was skilled in the word of God. This Ezra, he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses. And, and, the, and the king gave him everything that he asked for because the hand of the Lord was upon him. You see, there was something about him that set him apart that everything he asked for, he was given. The king granted him everything he asked because the hand of the Lord was upon him. The favor of God was upon him. Would it be said of me, would it be said of you that the hand of the Lord was upon me? You see, where, where is the evidence that the hand of the Lord is upon our lives? Where does it come from? You know, there's a, there's a phrase in, in Isaiah 66 at the very end. It says, this is, a, this is the one upon whom I will look, the Lord says. The one who is humble and contrite of heart and who trembles at my word. 
Would that be said of you? Would that be said of me? That, 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 that I'm someone upon whom God looks and he says, this is the guy. This Ezra, this guy. This guy is someone who is humble. This guy is someone who follows me. This, this is someone who, who I can trust. This is someone I'm going to put my hand on. And in this season of uncertainty in the world, in this season of, of, of fear that surrounds us, I want to be one of those people. It would be said, the hand of the Lord is upon him. The, land, the hand of the Lord is upon her. The, land, the hand of the Lord is upon them as a family. You see, we want to be known as people. Who've, who are skilled in the word of God, people who, who set our, live our lives. Am I humble? Am I, you know, the prayer of David throughout the Psalms is always, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Do we really tremble? Do we really, do we really examine our hearts in the morning and say, Lord, would your hand be upon me? Would I be pleasing to you? The, the Bible says in the Psalms, his, his word is a, a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Are, are we using it? Are we walking in it? And in a season like we're in right now, it's a time to, to evaluate our lives. I want the hand of the Lord to be upon me. I want my life to, to count for something. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to this young pastor, Timothy, and he says, 2 Timothy 2, he says, do your best to present yourself. To God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, skillful, rightly handling the word of truth. Because if we rightly handle the word of truth, if we're skilled in, with the word of God, what we will see in our lives is an abundance of the fruit of God, the fruit of the Spirit of God, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things that the Bible says there is no law. Because those who belong to Jesus, Paul continues, that they, they've, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If not, then, then we're not really living like people who belong to Jesus. And in this season, I want to be one upon whom it's said the hand of the Lord is upon him. I want to be one who's, who, who stands out amidst, amidst the crowd and the hysteria and the fear. And, and, and the terror that surrounds us as one who stands for Jesus Christ. I want the evidence of God upon my life. I want the hand of the Lord upon my life. You see, Ezra was a student of God's word. He loved God's word. He was taught because God's word prepares us. God's word prepares us to live lives which will enjoy his favor and his protection and, and, and his his, his, the intimacy of relationship with him. His word, this Ezra, God's word. But God's word does more than just prepare us. God's word instructs us. We read this in, in verse 10. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in all Israel. You see, Ezra wasn't just a student of God's word. He was a doer of God's word. Those of you who are part of our women's groups that meet on Tuesday, you've been learning all about this, that, that it's, it's not good enough to just know the word of God or read the word of God. You've got to actually be a doer of it. You, you, you've, you know, James asked this question. He says, what's the point of hearing if you're not going to do it? And, and the truth is you can study and you can learn. I mean, for me in my life, truthfully, it's, it's, I find it easy to read God's Word, and I find it actually fairly easy to teach God's Word. Um, but I'll tell you what I find really hard. I find it really hard to live by it. You see, I can, I can, I can tell you what it says, and I can understand what it means. But, but, but the difficulty is, is living it out in my life, because I'm always tempted to be a hypocrite, because I say that I should have love, joy, peace, patience. But I'm, I'm an impatient person and I'm aware of my impatience when everything around me starts falling apart. I'm aware of my impatience in, on a Monday morning, not necessarily on a Sunday morning. I'm aware of it when, when, when I'm, I'm with my family and with my kids. You see, see it's, poss it, it, it's possible uh, that, that we, we, we think that we're taught by the word of, of the Lord we, we, we think that the Word of God has, has impacted our life, but, but we've got to set our hearts not just to read it, but to do it and to teach it. You see, you can read it and you can live it, but, 
but you never pass it on to anybody else. And you, can, and you can read it and understand it, and maybe you can teach it but not live it. You see, you've got to do all three things. Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord. He, he, he wasn't just making this up as he went along. He didn't have crazy, he didn't just pick a verse and just kind of, you know, draw some kind of conclusion from it. He studied the word of God. He knew how to handle the word of God rightly. But, but he also lived according to the word of God, and he determined in his heart he was going to pass it on. He was going to pass it on to those around him. He was going to teach it. You see, we, so often those of us who study the Word of God, we do so in order to make ourselves look better, to celebrate our knowledge and our understanding. Uh, not so that we might live by it, but, but, but the truth is, is that in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this to, to the church in Corinth. He says, he says in 2 Corinthians 3, he says, do, do I commend myself to you? He said it's really easy. You know, there's a lot of people out there, there's a lot of preachers out there who, who commend themselves by, by these letters of recommendation. But he said to them, he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Do we need a, a thousand likes on, on Facebook or, or follows or shares, you know? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. Your living letters, your living epistles, Paul says, read by all men. And you show us that you're a letter from Christ delivered to us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. You see, if I'm called to you, to walk with you, to care for you, then people are going to know what's going on in my life by what's going on in your life. You see, we, we're actually connected with each other. And, and, and the people that are around me and the people that I spend my time with, they read my life. They see my life. They understand if, if I am actually living according to my life or not, according to my words or not. They understand these things. I want G to know Jesus better myself so you know Jesus better. And I want to demonstrate his life more fully so you might live more fully in the life that Jesus has called you to do. You see, your pursuit of him is connected to my pursuit of him. If you're not pursuing him, in some ways it's because I'm not pursuing him because we're connected with each other. Because I might be reading but not doing, or I might be doing but not teaching. And, and we reflect each other. You reflect me, I reflect you. We're connected with each other. And, and if I want God to move in our community, in our nation, it's got to begin with me. It's got to begin with me. You see, we're living epistles, read by all men, and people are watching our lives. People are watching not just our words, they're watching how we're living our lives. And no more time like the time of the present, people are looking. They're looking to see if you really trust this God that you say holds the universe in the palms of his hands. Why did God call Abraham? We read about it in, in Genesis 18. He says, I called you Abraham, I called Abraham because I knew that you would teach your children. You see, we don't just take the word of God and hold it for ourselves. We're called to be readers, to study, to, to learn and to teach. To, to study it, to do it and to teach it, it so, that we're, so that we'll pass it on to the next generation. Because we're all, in a sense, living epistles, read by all men. And so the question is asked in, later on in, 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 the, in the book of, 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 in the letter to the Corinthians, you know, what is commending you to God? What, why is it that the hand of the Lord is upon you? Because everything else is wood and hay and stubble. But you, you the people of God, us, we, the people of God, we, we're a temple that lasts forever. We're, 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 in us, the presence of God dwells. And, and people are looking for the authentic revelation of God in the lives of his people. Because God's word doesn't just prepare us, it instructs us. It tells us how we should live. And it, it puts a fire in our hearts that we want to pass it on. And, and we are called to not just be those who know the word of God and to live by the word of God, but we pass it on to those around us because they're looking at our lives. And they're listening to our words. And they're watching our actions. And, and everybody is re reading you. Everybody is watching you. What are you teaching them in this season? God's word instructs us. Finally, 
verse 25 of Ezra chapter 7. It says, And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of God that's in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river, such as knows the laws of your God and those who do not know them you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed upon him, whether for death or banishment or confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. You know, according to the wisdom of God that's in your hand, you see, Ezra had a heart for God's word, but the wisdom of God was in his hand. It was accessible to him. It was useful to him. It wasn't buried in a book somewhere. The Word of God makes us wise. See, the Word of God doesn't just prepare us and it doesn't just instruct us, but it also judges us. Because above all, it was Ezra's grasp of the Word and the law and the principles of God. It was his understanding of the Word of God that gave him the authority. Not just the authority delegated by the king, but this authority to command and to teach and to judge the people. You see, the Word of God, it judges us. The only way we can, we, the Word of God can judge us, we've got to learn to be judged by it ourselves. In Hebrews chapter 4, the writer says, For the Word of God is living and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. You see, God's word allows us to judge ourselves. It rips us open. It pierces our heart. It exposes our nakedness. It it makes us realize that that, that our our great need of him, our, our great how we fall short, uh, the sinfulness of our, of our thoughts and, and the deceitfulness of our desires, so that our shame can be exchanged for, for Jesus' righteousness, our nakedness can be clothed with his garments of, 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 of righteousness. This Ezra, this is the guy that came up from Babylon. This is the guy who rebuilt the nation. This is the guy born in a season of exile in a pagan city far away, yet someone who was skilled in the law of the Lord, prepared by the word of God in his mind, judged by the word of God in his heart. Oh, that we would be a people who are, who are, who are prepared by the word of God in this season, that we'd be a people who are, who are instructed by the word of God in this season, that we are people who who would be judged by the word of God, that we would apply the word of God to our hearts and we'd let it, we'd let it rip us open. We'd let it reconstruct us. We'd let it challenge our thinking, challenge our thoughts. You see, God is not just interested in returning his people to the land. God's not just interested in restoring us to where we were. God's interested in returning us to him, in restoring us to relationship with him. You see, the land, the, the return of the exiles to the land of, of, of Israel, of Judah, was a vehicle by which to return them to their true destination, which is a relationship with the living God. God want, brings us into his house that we might return to him. As I close, I want you to turn to one last scripture. And it's found in The prophet Hosea, Um, Hosea chapter 6. It's towards the end of the Old Testament after Daniel, uh, which follows Ezekiel and and Jeremiah and those those, uh, the longer prophetic books. And and there's these three verses of Hosea chapter 6, which have really been um, on my heart, I guess, this week for us as a church community and and, and in our place in, in our community and and in our state, and in our nation. And it says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Come, let us return to the Lord. The Lord wants to return us to himself. And in this season where everything is paralyzed and everything is, 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 is cut short, 
where everything is, is cut off, where everything seems to be disconnected. In this season, the Lord is calling his people, won't you return to me? Won't you return to me? Won't you prioritize me? Won't you, won't you, won't you seek me? You see, he will heal us and he will bind us and he will revive us that we might live before him. He's not going to restore us that we might live according to our own desires anymore. He's not going to restore us so we just carry on business as usual as we always have. One foot in the world and one foot in his kingdom. He's, he's allowing us all to be shaken that we might return to him. Wherever you are, the Lord is calling you to return to him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. For his going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the refreshing spring rains that water the earth. He will come and revive us if only we will call out to him. If only we will cry out to his name. You see, how do we return to God? How do we, an exiled people, return to the place of his true restoration? We must be a people who love his word. We must be a people who are prepared by his word. We must be a people who are willing to live according to his word. Not just according to our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own desires, but according to how he instructs us to live. But a people who radiate his word, a living epistles read by all men. Like this Ezra, this Ezra, this Becca, this Jeff, this John, this, this Willanette, this, this Tom, this Beth, this Mike, this Catherine, this Ali, this Debbie, this Virginia, this Jose. Whoever you are, wherever you are watching, this message is for you. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us that he might heal us. He has struck us down, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us on the third day. And it's, it's symbolic of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave on that third day. That we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn, and he will come to us as showers, as spring rains that water the earth. Heavenly Father, I just pray for everyone within the sound of my voice. Lord, the, the call of your word is clear, that you're calling us to return to you, to return to your word, to return to how you have instructed us to live. Lord, you're calling us to return to your cross, to lay down our burdens, to lay down our sin, to lay down our shame. And, and Heavenly Father, to trust you with our lives and to press on to know you. Lord, you're calling your church to return to you. Lord, because we've, we've set up all these idols, we've set up all these ideas of what church should be and what it should look like, and you're stripping us down that you might revive us, that you might restore us to yourself. Lord, come, come, let us return. Lord, may your people return to you. Lord, we desire to return to you. Lord, would you draw near to us? In Jesus' name.